Well, we covered the basics last time and talked a little bit about what it was like in the early days of home computing and especially home video gaming. Now it's time to talk about one of my favorite eras, the era of the best-selling computer of all time, a record not likely to ever be beaten, the Commodore 64. One day, my dad told me we were gonna go to Toys R Us in Oklahoma City, which is about an hour and a half drive from where I live. Now, Toys R Us really deserves a whole video of its own. It's difficult to put an emphasis on how important Toys R Us was to the purchasing of video games. They had everything. They sold computers, video games, business software, whatever you needed. The process of purchasing software or hardware from Toys R Us always fascinated me and felt like something really important, almost clandestine as a kid. The way that it worked was they had aisles of copies of the cover of a video game and you could flip it up and you could see what was on the back of the box. And there was a little kind of a pocket underneath with slips of paper you could pull out that had the price of the game on it, what the game was, and probably a barcode. If you wanted the game or the console, you would take that slip up to the register, pay for it. Then you would go to this little armored box. You know, it had a desk with a little window and wire so you couldn't get in there and you would ring a buzzer and then as soon as they could get there one of the Toys R Us staff would come to the booth you'd slip the piece of paper to them and all the shelves back behind locked up carefully were all of the computers and video games that they actually had in stock. If there was no slip of paper in the pocket in the store you knew they didn't have that game in stock. So all that aside we get to Toys R Us and my dad tells me we're buying a Commodore 64. I had no idea what this was, but we bought it. It was about $600. We bought a tape drive for it. It wasn't a floppy drive. It was a cassette tape recorder and player that hooked up to the computer. And we bought a copy of Frogger on cassette tape that you loaded into there and you could tell the computer to load the game off the tape and you waited forever and then you could play Frogger. I think at first, this really didn't mean a lot to me, but I had a good friend, he had a Commodore 64 and he had lots of games for it. Over time, I would save my allowance and once a month, my sister and I would generally beg our parents to drive up to Oklahoma City and take us to Toys R Us and just to the mall to do some shopping. Again, this is before the internet. So the only way I learned what was available to purchase was to go to the store. There were even very few magazines at the time, really. There was another store at the mall that was right next to the Toys R Us. It was a Crossroads Mall, rest in peace, it's gone. And of course the Toys R Us is gone at this point. But more on that in another video. There was a store at the mall called B. Dalton. It was a bookstore. In the back, they had computer software and computers on display. As time went on, that became a more important part of their business, and the name of the store changed to B. Dalton Software Etc. I always just walked right through the books and back to the software. That, that was what I was there for. It was difficult buying a video game at this time, because like I said, you couldn't see reviews of it. You hadn't been waiting for the game to come out for months. You learned about it by seeing the box at the store. They might have a game on their in-store system that you could try out and play. They often would do that kind of thing. But apart from that, you had to go by the artwork and the graphics and the description on the box. If the game was on multiple systems, the box would always show the graphics from the best system. Sometimes the box wouldn't even show real graphics for the game. Sometimes it would show like an artist's conception of what the graphics were like. That was a big red flag for me, even as an elementary school student. I was not about to spend the allowance that I had saved up all month, usually about 25 bucks at the most, on a game that didn't even show me its own graphics. The programmers weren't even proud enough of it to put the actual graphics on the box. But some of my favorite games were on the Commodore 64. I, I found a box here. It's got some of my old games in it. I'm just gonna look through it. Ah, Skate or Die, that was a classic. Had amazing music, especially on the title screen. There was like 
sampled guitar sounds, it seemed like. That was just trying to sound all edgy. I was a skateboarder, or at least I pretended I was. I had a lot of friends who were skateboarders and, you know, I could ollie, but not like while I was moving. It, I just used it as transportation. Zach McCracken and the Alien Mindbenders. This is a lesser known LucasArts adventure game uh, along the lines of Maniac Mansion, the Monkey Island series, Full Throttle later on, games like that. You're a tabloid reporter who ends up involved with aliens who are making the population dumb through the telephone company. It was a really weird but awesome game. Infiltrator, that was a classic. Helicopter game, you had to push all the right buttons on the keyboard to get the systems going uh, in order to take off at the beginning. And then when you flew to the location, you landed and actually got out of the helicopter and had to run around on the base. And sometimes guards would find you and you had to show them your papers. And sometimes they would think your papers were in order and randomly they would say, your papers are not in order. And you were pretty much done for at that point. But I loved playing that. This was one of my favorites, Legacy of the Ancients. The way that games made themselves feel epic was to have an overworld map in the old days. I mean, they still do it to some degree at this point, but when you think about it, that's really a trick. When you're out in the world, you're walking over a huge map from town to town, and you feel like the world is larger than it actually is. Legacy of the Ancients did that really well, but it also had a museum the idea was that this museum was put there by the ancients, hence the name, and you could use these special tokens that you found out in the world to activate exhibits in the museum that would allow you to go to certain dungeons or a transport to a certain world or get a certain item that would help you in the world. It was really clever. I would love to see a modern remake of it. The premise was just amazing. Ah, I just put so many hours into that game. It was, it was great. Defender of the Crown, there was a company called Cinemaware. They specialized in making games that had incredible graphics, and their idea was that they would feel like a movie. And uh, they, they did a really good job of it with, with, with what they had. Some of the best graphics to ever be squeezed out of the Commodore 64 were done by Cinemaware. But this was my favorite game of all time, Mail Order Monsters, and you can see See that spot on the label that's all worn out? Yeah, that's because I flipped the disc so many times. When you went into combat, you had to switch it to side B, and when it was over, you had to go back to side A. This was kind of a predecessor to Pokemon. You ordered a monster in the mail, you picked the type of monster, you customized it, you could give it tentacles, you could give it gills, then you bought special weapons for it, and you went out into arena combat with other monsters. My friend James had a copy, and then I bought a copy, and you would save your characters on a backup disc. We would work single player and build up our characters and then take it over to each other's house and have our monsters fight. We thought that our characters would also die, so every time we lost a match, we'd just eject the disc and turn off the system. Uh, I'm not sure that was really the case. That seems a little modern roguelike for the early 80s. But regardless, we had untold hours of fun with that game. And notice that game was an electronic arts game. Electronic arts used to be a really nice, good company. They were just a publisher for groups or two or three guys who made a game. And usually that's the way games were made back then. You had about three people. You had somebody doing the music, you had somebody doing the graphics, and you had somebody doing the programming. There would generally be a photo and sometimes a message from the developers of the game inside the packaging. You know, I think I've got my Legacy of the Ancients box. There it is. Yeah, here's an example. Legacy of the Ancients. Beautiful artwork, nothing like the actual game, but I still love the game. It's got a lot of screenshots on the back. On the inside, there is actually, if you can see it, 
There's a photo of the two guys who made the game down there in the corner. In spite of the fact that they're twin brothers, Chuck and John Doherty bring a very different experiences to the field of computer gaming. And it gives like a whole biography. You know, nowadays, you watch credits for minutes at the end of the game, but major titles were being put out by two and three guy teams. This is the old Electronic Arts logo, by the way. When you were loading a Commodore 64 game up, you got to stare at the logo changing colors usually for two or three minutes at the very least. There was one other game that my mother and I spent endless hours playing together. It was called The Castle of Dr. Creep. My grandfather bought this game for me as a birthday present and I didn't know anything about it. He just said, I saw the guys playing this in the store and I thought it looked neat, so I, I bought it for you. And, and my initial response from the packaging was just like, well, you know, I was polite to him, but in my mind I was like, this doesn't look like it's gonna be very good. It was fantastic. It is a puzzle-based platformer with a maze-like structure that you can play as two players cooperatively, or you can even split up. The premise is something strange like uh, the castles of Dr. Creep are up for sale and you're the real estate agent and you have to tour the houses before you can put them up for sale. But the, the mansions are full of Frankenstein's monsters, zombies, automated laser turrets, moving platforms, force fields, teleporters, all kinds of weird things. You have to solve puzzles to get keys to open doors and finally make your way to the exit. It's really clever, really well done, and I am happy to say, was excited to discover that The Castles of Dr. Creep is available for PC on Steam. It's just the Commodore 64 version, as near as I can tell, made to work on a PC. You can buy that uh, for just a few dollars. The only complaint I would really have about it is that sometimes the controls are really particular and sticky. When you're trying to go down a ladder or get off a ladder, he gets stuck a lot, which can get you caught and cause you to mess up a puzzle. But it's really an underrated forgotten game, just like Mail Order Monsters. Another game that my mother loved particularly, but I also loved was called Dino Eggs. Dino Eggs is also available on Steam, but I haven't bought it. I, I, I feel like it's a revamped version of it, given modern graphics. Dino Eggs was a story, you're a time traveler, who gave the dinosaurs measles and you feel bad so you're trying to take dinosaur babies to the future to keep the species alive because it's your fault they're going extinct. It doesn't really matter. You're running around a single screen game. You are searching for dinosaur eggs which you carry over. You put them in your time machine and teleport and then you will appear somewhere else in the stage. Go around trying to get more eggs. You're also trying to protect them from these giant spiders that are trying to eat the baby dinosaurs. So there's this crazy dynamic of you. You can lay out the eggs so that they'll hatch into babies. You jump over the baby dinosaurs, it puts a little force field around them and protects them from the spiders. Then when you teleport out, they go with you then. You also have to keep fires going because if you don't have a fire going, then the mother will show up every now and then and her giant foot will stomp down on the screen and you have to try to avoid being squished. So as your fire's starting to go out, it says, build a fire. Mom is coming and you're scrambling to try and find two pieces of wood so you can make a fire. It's a really clever game. I, I doubt it really has any end, but we played it and played it and, and just had a ton of fun with that. So when I say that the Commodore 64 was the best-selling computer of all time, that might strike you as weird because computers are way more popular now, obviously, than they were in the mid 80s. But you gotta understand the Commodore 64 was a singular machine. There's no one model of Gateway or Dell or HP computers that's sold to the level of the Commodore 64. So to some extent, it's kind of like how the series finale of MASH had more viewers than any other show. Well, there were only three channels on TV back then. You know, nowadays there's a lot of other stuff going on. When MASH came on, most people watched it. There were no VCRs, there were no other channel choices. But that really doesn't undercut the impact that the Commodore 64 had on society at the time. Certainly on me and on other people who played games and programmers, there were tons of things you could do with the Commodore 64. I didn't even mention, we had a tablet 
called the Koala Pad. I've still got it somewhere. It was an early drawing tablet. It, you had to really bear down with this plastic pencil in order to draw pictures. But I spent so much time drawing pictures with that. And then we had this Okidata printer. It was a color printer, but it had thermal ribbon. So it would take like 20 minutes, literally, to print one picture out. It was melting with a little heated element the color onto the page. It didn't work super well either. There were obvious gaps between the rows, but it was, you know, the best there was. We, we, we liked it just fine. I don't know how long I've been rambling. You whippersnappers have got better things to do than listen to me talk all day. So I'll probably have to touch more on the Commodore 64 at some point. It'll surely cross over into another conversation. But the early 80s were ruled by the Commodore 64. Thanks for watching.